chapter eighteen of transition this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org transition by emma frances brooke chapter eighteen lucilla found it horribly damp and cold and miserable in the short train journey she had to take her sensations in the omnibus drive from the station to bloomsbury were worse the rattle of the wheels over the stones made her head giddy and the jolting jarred her nerves then all alive with diseased sensitiveness as she was her fellow-passengers disgusted and sickened her a great german leaned across and bawled commonplaces into the ears of two long-suffering compatriots his pair of gesticulating fat and grimy hands spreading over their knees and under their very noses the spectacle offended lucilla i have become fastidious said she escaping with aching head and nerves from the rattle and bluster but the short walk that remained before she could reach the museum was an extremity of cold clinging evil the streets were wet and a remnant of fog too weak to descend and too feeble to escape hung in the overcharged atmosphere afflicting the body with chills and the spirit with untold depression lucilla walked on pressing her small foot down in the thin sea of mud undauntedly but her face was desperate arrived at the british museum she did not find in the reading desk the cure she expected the dictionary and the array of books failed to inspirit her of late a singular lethargy had sometimes oppressed her and a feeling of physical weakness and uneasiness hard to comprehend every now and then she shivered at last she concluded that the effort of study was for the moment useless in leaving her books she went to the refreshment room for a cup of hot coffee it was no use returning to her work immediately the power of concentration seeming to have left her and when she came out of the refreshment room she began to wander aimlessly about looking at one thing after another but with scant interest and poor attention at last she paused wearily under the pedestal of one of the nereids the galleries felt at once close and chilly everything was vault-like and no object had the power to catch her thought from its own preoccupation it returned now to the conversation with honora it was because honora has not got it in her to reject my advice but i talked as i did said she to herself but what would i not give to be able to speak effectually in the same strain to my own self and yet it was foolish random talk with a bit of good advice embedded in it what would honora make of it all i wonder what lies under her fine serenity does she perhaps love leslie littleton how she would support his life and transfix it she wandered round the room glancing cursorily at the sculptures and returned to the same spot she stood quite still close against the nereid who with bare foot and wind-filled garment seemed ready to rush past her yes continued lucilla to herself i would give a good deal to be able to tender such sane and obvious advice to my own mind with a chance of getting it accepted a whimsical smile altered the thin cheek for a moment but i'm fatally against my own self it is always something mystic sharp that speaks through me i have a goad in my own hand to turn against my own breast if i want to step aside for a moment something urges me on and i can't do it what significance there is in everything the one thing befalls us that can befall at that moment she turned her head with a restless movement the arch to the right of the mausoleum was she found occupied by a passing figure and when she saw it the crimson rushed into her cheek 
and her heart gave a sickening movement in her breast it was months since she had seen paul sheridan and that was he who had gone by the passing figure disappeared he was walking aimlessly as though infected by the day's depression presently he returned lucilla's eyes were still fixed on the open arch an incredible choking bitterness had assailed her at the sight of him she did not dream of running forward to accost him now her foot indeed seemed rooted to the ground and a presentiment of impending fate was the uppermost feeling of her mind but this time he saw her raised his hat and advanced smiling my successful friend said lucilla holding out her hand with a dry air paul's cheek coloured sensitively he was eagerly glad to see her again he had so sincere a feeling of friendship for the girl and had missed her at every turn of his life her late attitude towards himself and others was to him a painful mystery his information concerning her being of the scantiest instinctively he felt himself to be somehow an offender but he had not the least idea of the reason and his single object was to soothe and conciliate it is a very long time since we met said he are you very busy reading i was just taking an off quarter of an hour from my desk i did not see you in the reading-room said she nor i you perhaps we were both too industrious but won't you come along now and look at greek vases with me i should prefer a more unsophisticated pottery said she with the same dry smile all right let us visit primitive man he returned glad of as much concession as was implied in her consent to accompany him having secured so much he led the way in the rapid insistent manner natural to him his movements contrasted strongly with the soft weary step of the girlish figure that followed near him lucilla looked slimmer and more feminine than ever her face tinted and altered by his presence was turned towards him reluctantly and her eyes followed every movement of his with a curious and notable expression there was prescience in her look and it lent momentary majesty to features that were chiselled for tenderer emotions turning round suddenly to speak to her he caught the import of her glance took a step back and walked beside her he had been turning over in his mind the wisdom of questioning her and now suddenly decided you have not been amongst us lately said he you have avoided us have i said lucilla wearily i think you have said he i hope there has not been any special cause i have missed you i should be sorry if you left us would you paul the voice that floated from her lips was soft and weary like the twitter of a winter bird when snows are on the ground and berries scarce indeed i should said he with friendly heartiness lately he added in a gentler tone i missed your congratulations lucilla that was the signal for a tumult of the brain she felt her own thoughts shake before her were there not enough then asked she with cold self-restraint why should i add mine to such a common heap his face fell a little at her tone and reply oh never mind he returned cheerily i dare say you did not think the occasion worth while after all my return to parliament is a matter of very relative importance only i missed you the heart was too kind to allow itself to be hurt and you yourself were glad she asked oh very it will take up an enormous amount of time but there was hardly anything that seemed to me so useful to do besides i like it and you sought it oh yes i put all i was into the election it's no use doing things by halves and then came praises yes i had fairly to be rescued by devoted friends from the hands of the enthusiastic electors paul was determined not to allow her cold manner to annoy or drive him away he was hurt but would not show it just so and you had no sense of nausea nausea why no what do you mean lucilla i meant to come out top if i could possibly compass it 
and when i did compass it of course i was glad that my fellows hurrahed and you do not distrust this success not particularly i am fully conscious of the limitations of our social knowledge still i wanted our programme to be everybody's programme the next thing is to get into parliament to push it the year has brought us on so fast said she twelve short months ago they were still throwing mud and stones at you now they bespatter you with flatteries i get my fair share of abuse still if that's a comfort to you lucilla he returned with a genial smile i tolerate the mud and i can survive the flattery they both just come in in the day's work my faith will not carry me over this era of praise what does that mean you are not going back on socialism surely i lucilla started indeed no it is not i who am going back i hope said paul with the first hint of irritation in his voice that you are not going to accuse me of doing so i suppose it is the method we have differed about that before they went on in silence side by side until they reached the potteries of early man here they paused sheridan taking occasion to glance at his companion was suddenly struck by ruth at the pallor and sadness of the young face beside him he was in two minds whether to relinquish the conversation or to continue it in his perplexity he stood for a moment with downcast eyes passing his hand over his moustache as was his wont in moments of indecision after all what had this slight creature to do with the rough struggle which formed so large a portion of his life had he not better leave her with some mere gentle assurance of undiminished kindliness and friendship rather than seek to carry her through an argument that he suspected was too harsh for her he did not decide upon his action when he looked up she was staring absently at the cases he came near the thought of his own annoyance absolutely extinguished and regarded her with a very kindly light in his eyes and lucilla stood still seeing across the cases and the stony remains of an age long dead the burning undiminished future of her dreams won't you look at these things said he and forget my delinquencies i believe i could tell you something about them i am afraid i am a very imperfect person but won't you forget that and give me what credit is my due remember he added in a still more musical voice that i am not able am not able to clothe myself with an ideal that is not mine but yours will you not trust me it is painful to me to be distrusted by a friend one expects it from a stranger or a foe but not from a friend lucilla her own name uttered in that tone struck her dumb she could not upbraid him but her mind was wide awake to her own meaning and her heart burnt sickened and saddened she felt acutely the divergence between them apparently he had never understood her certainly he was not understanding her now but then did she understand him supposing after all we are strangers she thought a great tremor went through her and she looked towards him with a new light in her eyes in which something of fear commingled sheridan catching the look returned it with one of inquiry afterwards he remembered and it was a lifelong memory that expression in her pale set face the meeting of their eyes startled her again into speech his own look became more wistful tenderer i cannot help it she exclaimed i don't think that it is personal it is that i distrust this phase it seems to me we must be fatally wrong to have reached it that is surely unreasonable he replied some part of what we set ourselves to bring about has come or is coming to pass we ought to congratulate ourselves hesitation just now would be a poor sort of tribute to our faith lucilla threw out her hands with an expressive gesture it has all been done through compromise not the very least said he it has been done through educating people in particular social notions until they came to accept them to me it is as though we had passed into the enemy's citadel by the simple process of selling our standard sheridan flushed angrily he was deeply hurt but he mastered himself out of consideration for her what would you have me do other than i have done said he quietly lucilla turned drawing herself up tensely 
and wearing in her eye a fierce bright spark do she cried i want you to come out of society and not be in it at all above all i want you to defy the miserable hypocrisy of our representative government i cannot bear you to take part in it you paul you ought to be the last to have entered that degrading place of shams which we call our parliament you should have remained outside to speak truths to them like swords sheridan's anger melted at once before the girl's passion his manner perceptibly mildened and he looked down on the ground with a musing smile all this what i ought to do said he what is it that i do you have taken their methods and used them to your own ends the girl's figure still quivered from the intensity of the flame that burned within paul threw back his head with a light laugh just so said he to the service of the social idea rather and what can i do better than that i am in the world for the purpose and i think i shall make some shift to talk swords as you call it inside the walls of parliament as well as outside but i want you she began you want me to be very heroic and very foolish and very rash he looked at her kindly and the blood mounted to her cheek a momentary perplexity came into her eyes don't you see he pursued seeing his advantage that you give away your own case what i have done is precisely what i ought to do he is a bad soldier who betrays his own cause out of rashness but come on i want to show you the bone scratchings the girl bent and broke for a moment under the influence of the strong man oh paul she cried with a desperate catch in her voice as they walked on and turning to him out of old blind habit for consolation and help i was so happy in the old days so happy and so certain in the days i mean when we used to have tea in my rooms and when we made conspiracies against society and everybody despised us a hint of something childlike and small reached him through her voice an answering flash came into his face it changed again and softened then he pressed nearer turning his tones to a very gentle key and when we despised everybody hey eh? i'm afraid we have had to learn wisdom since but there was a good deal of fun in it wasn't there and we were all very fiery and young and ignorant it was a golden time i allow but we cannot keep such things lucilla it would not be right even to try i'm afraid it is a stern lesson but we have got to pass on and to accept graver responsibilities with older years if i only could believe if i only could believe the words were almost whispered sheridan who was himself painfully impressed with the sense of limitation in the available amount of knowledge of the general social structure could not but feel this search after a short cut to social redemption to be a miserable craze come said he once more clearing his face to kindly effort it isn't as bad as all that why should you try to believe anything now i'll try to explain don't you see that the difference between you and me is the difference between the revolutionary and democratic spirit is it said lucilla forlornly yes i take into practical consideration existing surroundings and you don't it seems to me we have altogether changed we have not we always mingled sanity with our biggest dreams an extreme revolutionist looks on a perfect knowledge of what must be done to put the world right as existing side by side with intolerable conditions but such coexistence is impossible part of the evil condition is our ignorance here and there we see a little bit that obviously may be done when we've done that our little bit we shall be in a better position for fresh aspiration and fresh action because we shall know more oh said lucilla it is wintry days with me now you talk of aspiration it is lost in compromise sheridan frowned slightly he was himself too constant and faithful in his attachments not to be susceptible under the unjust blame of a friend he had hardly the heart for the moment to argue any more the energy 
died out of his voice and the light from his eyes suddenly he felt hopeless of any genuine understanding i really think i am pretty plain-spoken said he rubbing his hand nervously over the glass case in which the unsophisticated pottery lay unnoticed while lucilla's deep eyes gazed at passionate visions after all when there is only one way the wise thing is to take it no she stamped her foot carve a new way well i must leave that to you lucilla you always have overrated me a troubled colour crept into his cheek now perhaps you are falling into the other kind of injustice i am certainly not a poet you perhaps would claim to be able to see the whole tree of social progress at once frankly to me the tree runs out of sight into the clouds all i can do is to see a little bit of progress at a time and to try and find the practical ways in which it may be realized you seemed to mean so much more than that i really do not follow you he returned in still gentle and carefully restrained tones you appear to ask me to act as though things were as they are not and to blame me for not being in a world that does not exist i find facts are so and so i perceive that certain changes have come about that they are here and mean to stay for the present i must adapt my theory of action to the things which are as i perceive them to be is that all is there nothing more not ultimately all of course but for the present yes we must not forget organic continuity i think we have in effect to deal with the mass of average men and not with exceptional units the method i select is one that tells on the present democratic average my ultimate aim is to raise that average to make the average man all round a higher being than he at present is but the lever i use must be an effectual one it is no use trying something impossible oh are there no ideals any more if you want me to find ideals amongst impossibilities frankly i cannot waste my time about it i must seek my expediencies my actions my moralities amongst sturdy facts still o'er the earth hastes opportunity seeking the hardy soul that seeks for her i cannot impose an ideal upon facts what i have to do is to find out what ideal these facts are trying to compel me to you will jump with the cat sheridan moved his head angrily if you describe in that way a piece of obvious sanity said he cut to the heart the impatient movement of his fingers over the glass marked the strain on his forbearance i call you to go on cried the girl in a fire of indignation there was something in her feeling at that moment ruthless remorseless paul left the case over which they had bent without seeing its contents and walked forward through the gallery lucilla following as before both faces were strangely disturbed distrait preoccupied lucilla no longer gazed at him but straight before her through a mist paul stung by the sense of injustice where he least had occasion to expect it heartily wished the conversation had never been begun even now however a sense of the girl's trouble and weakness left the uppermost feeling one of a sincere desire to help and console for his regret at the division of opinion between them was acute and perennial it led him to tune his voice to a tone of studied gentleness to force back a smile to his harassed face and to make one more effort i really think you want said he to break society to pieces in your wrath no i don't in the least desire to do that i admit its misery and sickness as much as you do but i want to try and discover what is the disease so that it may cure itself my faith that society can do this is simply invincible oh she threw her hands out again with that expressive gesture you talk of faith you have let faith in method take the place of faith in principle it seems to me lucilla that the failure in faith is yours an all-or-nothing business like ibsen's brand is fatal because it is false never say that i fail in faith cried lucilla whose burning belief in the impossible was her greatest misfortune she spoke with heartfelt earnestness 
and a breaking voice very well lucilla said paul very quietly i will not say it i will not be as hard on you as you are on me she could not reply her breast was heavy with suspended sobs hard on him and he not hard on her the world was full of some great cloud of confusion and her own words bitterly returned to her memory now as cruel missiles that had fallen she knew not how or why but which had certainly failed to convey her meaning it was no use speaking any more speech was a mere rending of each spirit with theories and their friendship lay like a torn thing between them how was it that the little rift in the lute had widened to this ruined music paul's heart was full of ruth at what had happened he would have given much to erase the impression from his own mind and from hers but he was conscious that every reach he had made across this chasm of divergent opinion to the reality of friendship beyond had been repulsed by the girl and that with bitter words he looked pale and worried and kept raising his hand nervously to his moustache he found it hard to bear the implied blame from lucilla he regretted her attitude missed her sympathy and disliked her discouragement and all the time it chafed him to be unable to detect whence the difference arose neither was responsible and neither was to blame phases of mind and character are not synchronous even between friends and the people who jostle each other in the street are not of the same hour or century this makes the difficulty and delicacy in human intercourse the pain of it and the sweetness of forbearance and forgiveness or the bitterness of anger and revenge but after all to sheridan when the most was said the incident was but one in the day a thousand calls would presently obliterate it from his mind as they neared the entrance to the bus gallery he shook off the depression which had seized him and turned to lucilla with rather a chillily bright air lucilla to whom on the contrary every one of his words had fallen like a never lifting pall stopped short feeling that the interview was at an end paul drew out his watch and glanced at it they stood under the five-legged assyrian bull whose stony brutality might well have represented to one at least of the pair the barbarity of circumstance besides divergence of opinion the barrier of sex was between them lucilla was too preoccupied to feel it the better instructed man was sharply conscious of it for the moment since all naturalness and spontaneity and coincidence of thought had passed out of their friendship nothing remained but for him to leave her alone he was not her lover the only right he had in her was the right that came from her spontaneous allegiance that gone he was not in a position to attempt a conquest i must be off he said holding out his hand to bid her adieu his face pale and full of ruth and compunction i am due at an appointment in less than a quarter of an hour good-bye i am sincerely sorry we have differed try and do as much justice to me as you can i shall always think well of you but don't expect too much of me i am nothing after all but a strong earth man not the least of an angel you know adieu au revoir he held her hand warmly for a second his eyes asking pardon the while hers did not grant it and then he turned away lucilla looked after him in dumb agony to her the termination of the interview had terrible significance for she knew that it had pushed her over the brink end of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of transition this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org transition by emma francis brooke chapter nineteen it is a frightful thing when a judgment against an idolized friend first darts into the mind it is worse when we begin to be so conscious of it that we are in constant terrified expectation of its reappearance as one is conscious of the grim thing hidden somewhere in the far-off chamber of a dream but if instead of gliding in to disappear again like some evil vermin leaving us scared and panting it come in boldly and take possession of the very heart then indeed something like desolation has fallen do i any longer believe in him 
those were the words which lucilla kept out of her mind as well as she could it had been cold in the galleries even when she turned into the open air it struck her keenly and the damp and the fog made her shiver she walked wearily feeling that with the depression of her spirits all her physical energy had vanished the climb up the stone staircase to her flat was made by an effort that seemed stupendous and she thought it was because she was so desperately out of heart that the idea of preparing her evening meal was distasteful finally she decided that it was as impossible as a labour of hercules and that besides she had no appetite the room was horribly cold and dark and she lit the fire at once crouching down before it to try and get a little warmth into her hands and body seated there she finally forgot about her food and fell into a deep mental struggle holding her trembling hands out to the bars her face looked pinched and wan and unheeded tears rolled down her cheeks in the girl's soul was a straight rigid something which could allow no compromise not even the capitulation of high wisdom it was not an ordinary emotion that sickened her spirit not jealousy disappointed affection or selfish fear and regret lucilla's tears had not that quality oh my friend my friend only be true only let me believe in you still i need nothing further there was hardly a variation of her thought as she sat on the hearth rug trying to keep warm while hours passed over her head it was all in that key all in that strain the belief in paul was inextricably intertwined with her allegiance to her old party should the one be disturbed the other broke down he stood for his party in the very essence of his nature and her rupture with him was her descent from all when he left her in the museum she knew that she was cut adrift but the scission was not to be made without cries and protests of the heart and affections it was a sacrificial event a painful act of self-isolation made by a rigid will and a passionately tender nature just because it was so hard it had to be she thought inexorably final it happened that honora turning over in her large and comfortable mind after lucilla had left her the conversation they had just held together concluded that the condition which prompted such talk indicated illness whereupon the idea of her friend alone in the workman's flat disturbed her and late in the afternoon she made up her mind to follow and see for herself if attention was required thus it happened that towards evening when it was already dark honora stepped out of the station and hailed a bloomsbury omnibus upon arriving at the workman's flat she found the door was ajar that was a sure sign that lucilla had returned indeed she heard sounds within in spite of this her knock failed to secure attention so after a moment's hesitation she pushed the door wider and looked in yes lucilla was there she was standing in the inner room holding a hammer in her hand her eyes were fixed on the place on the wall where above the portrait of sheridan had formerly hung the crucifix this now lay in broken pieces on the ground and as honora entered unperceived lucilla raised her hand and dealt a blow at the portrait it was vigorously and firmly delivered so that the glass was instantly shivered into fragments and the picture ruined there was deliberation rather than passion in her manner but so absorbed was she that the presence of honora was still unnoticed honora beheld the spectacle of the freshly murdered christ with a keen illogical sense of desecration and dismay 
and of the broken portrait with a more human pang lucilla whispered she lucilla started and faced her letting her arms fall to her sides a flush followed by pallor altered her cheek ah said she with her stillest manner for work like this i should have locked the door honora's eyes fixed on the shattered crucifix filled with tears the early association of her life was strong for the moment and all her best thoughts of her father mingled with the broken image what have you done to the crucifix said she and then she looked at the shattered picture and raising her hand pointed to that also in inquiry lucilla her hammer still grasped in her slight hand took a turn or two through the room after which she came back and faced her friend what have i done with that christ she repeated i suppose i am slaying him afresh he is the personal in us we have to slay the personal now our leaning on him is all personal we have got to stand alone she spoke steadily looking at honora all the time with a white face and pathetic eyes honora was still speechless and stupefied and had tears under her lids lucilla laid the hammer on the table and placed both hands on her friend's shoulders democracy oh democracy murmured she under her breath at this honora roused herself and began to speak with extraordinary energy fudge said she with an impatient stamp of the foot i thought mr sheridan stood for democracy and now you've smashed him up smashed him brutally lucilla breaking his nose and knocking in his clever eyes as to the crucifix i hate such work i've no reason to love the church it came between my own father and me still i never see a crucifix but i think of him and on the whole i'd rather you had levelled your wicked random blows at me than at the christ she had broken from her friend and was down on her knees picking up the fragments and gathering them in her dress the angry tears rolling the while over her cheeks when all the portions were collected she carried them to the table then she took the portrait and sat down patiently endeavouring to make the injury it had sustained a degree less ugly and apparent all the time lucilla who had seated herself by the fire remained passive with her face rather coldly turned aside it is no use said honora wiping her eyes i can't mend him i can't see for tears i am afraid that he is spoiled for good i never should have dreamed you could be guilty of an act of frenzy like this i don't think that it was frenzy said lucilla quietly i was not angry it looked uncommonly like it said honora whose eyes and voice alike snapped in her hearty indignation well i can't mend it as i say neither can i put the crucifix together again let me at least cover up the fragments decently put the portrait in the fire said lucilla do that yourself i don't like the man he is no friend of mine but i declare i have not the heart to burn him then give it to me honora did not move lucilla got up reached her hand quietly to the portrait sat down again and held it in the flame until it was consumed then she took the frame deliberately broke it across her knee and put the pieces on the top of the fire she sat and watched them burn honora drew a deep breath i think that a wicked piece of hardness said she honora said lucilla don't what has mr sheridan done nothing nothing special when did you see him last about an hour ago as though exclaimed honora in fresh indignation an hour were a sufficient interval between impulse and action for indeed it is action with a vengeance to come and take a hammer to the face of a friend but it was not impulse i know what i was about i am sure of my own meaning you never can be sure of anything when you are in a rage honora i was not in a rage i repeat that i was not angry you don't understand 
oh i do said honora i understand better than you do you call it something grand i name it mere fury mr sheridan probably said something detestable to do you and him justice he can manage that sort of thing fairly well and you came home in a rage and there was the hammer and there was his face and you flew at him like a wicked child that is the whole tale lucilla honora yes mr sheridan said nothing detestable it was i who said all the detestable things that reflection then probably deepened your anger it makes it clear of course if anger is intolerable it is just as well to do something to ease it but you should always keep an eye on the future moment which you have not done i mean the inevitable sober moment which will arrive to find the anger gone it really is a mere point of sanity to remember that emotion is not always boiling over lucilla sat still looking into the fire now as i believe i told you i once was very very angry with a friend i once found it imperatively necessary to do something rash with leslie littleton's face he had infuriated me and i really could not bear to have it hanging in my room and insulting me but i did not rush at him with a hammer really lucilla what an atrocity i just slammed it in a drawer and turned the key on it and there it lay for months for months lucilla did it yes for months and when i took it back again you understand that it had quite a friendly air there is no point of resemblance said lucilla i beg you to believe me oh yes there is said honora human nature is pretty much the same everywhere even socialist human nature particularly quarrels is this a quarrel a bad one i suspect i am sure lucilla that you will call it by some grand name that does a great deal of harm i have not the least doubt that you have treated him badly from a sense of duty i have no great admiration for mr sheridan but i like justice to be done and i am beginning to fear that there is something ridiculously final about this oh yes quite final and that is absurd we've no business to be final unless circumstance compels us a door can always be left ajar a door must be either shut or open fiddlesticks that is all nonsense i suspect you of taking too much upon yourself indeed i am sure lucilla said nothing her head drooped wearily honora gently rose from her seat and came across to her and knelt by her side taking her into her arms the two heads nestled together do you know what i am going to do said she changing her sharp tones to a very soft whisper no returned lucilla what is it there is a nail left on the wall the christ and the portrait hung from it i am going in a few days to bring you a new picture to hang there what picture shall you bring one of watts's his picture of life and love i know where i can buy a copy oh said lucilla with her breath between her teeth there isn't any love yes said honora there is her red lips touched the pale cheek there is some here there always is plenty of love though perhaps of a humble kind a picture of that type will be better to hang from the nail on your wall than sacrifice and democracy she uttered the last word with a subtle careless scorn as though it were a trifle an air-ball that the prick of a pin could collapse she laughed a little with her lips close to lucilla's ear as she said with gentle derision you are too tiny for such grand ideas lucilla said nothing a tear or two slipped from under her lids once continued honora rather timidly i thought i could do without my father's love i considered that he had wronged me and when i had to leave him i went away with my heart cold i am beginning to learn i think it came through our work with the children i think perhaps you taught me i am beginning to learn that i cannot do without it that whether he wronged me or not i must win his love again she took lucilla's hand your hand is very cold said she and now we have come to the end of the lecture your cheek is hot that means that you are ill have you had food no i have not felt hungry well then you are going to bed and i shall prepare you some food to tell the honest truth i suspected the worst and brought something dainty in a basket now i will help you to undress and until you are asleep i will stay with you 
it was in this way that the bitter day came to an end it finished up for lucilla in an unlooked-for sense of consolation she lay tired beyond anything that she had guessed in a room full of light and warmth the hand of a friend had fed her honora's comely form was within her eye her strong presence near she sang too softly in a clear sweet voice lucilla had no idea that honora could sing then she chose such pretty melodies not too bright but mild and swaying surely that was not a vegan lead how strange of honora it was very pleasant it was springtime twilight when the shadows are tender birds crept to their nests and so listening she fell asleep End of chapter nineteen chapter twenty of transition this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org transition by emma frances brook chapter twenty lucilla never once wavered in the resolution she had taken after sheridan's election and her interview with him and for a couple of months at least she had no intercourse either with him or her other friends of his set time did not mitigate her view of his attitude on the contrary his sagacity and time wisdom took to her eyes increasingly an aspect of treachery to the cause it was with consuming grief that she thought of him but never with a hint of return d'auvernay's position on the other hand came nearer suiting the rigid ideal which she had set up as truth it fitted better the useless puristic socialism which her mental proclivities led her to adopt and she had gone over to him and his set heart and soul as she believed and as new converts are apt to do she made herself particularly active in propaganda work throwing most unsparing efforts into it indeed she urged her crude dogma of revolt with an unhesitating energy which would have been shocking had not the strength of it been so fine sheridan in spite of his new interests and busy life did not forget lucilla rumours of her definite adhesion to the anarchist party had reached him and affected him with genuine sorrow he never thought of her save with a pang of pity and regret he was occasionally prompted to write to her but hesitation so far had baffled the half-formed desire he could not make up his mind as to the wisdom of approaching her again even of the right of it at the same time he was not able to set the idea completely aside in honora's new school lucilla performed her duties with exhausting pertinacity honora was tempted at times to regret the touch of feverishness she put into her energies the growing frailty of her form alarmed her and what too had altered her eyes and made them look so strained and harsh lucilla met every inquiry as to her health with an air of surprise but she bent more and more to her friend's devotion throwing herself pathetically under the shadow of honora's wise protective affection yet never so far yielding to it as to permit it to save her honora even in the girl's softest moments felt that she touched her over some circle of reticence which nothing could induce her to break down meanwhile the affection penetrated more and more into her own nature and became something singularly persistent and tender so that she who gave the most drew in reality the signal benefit one evening in the middle of november lucilla upon entering her flat saw that the box behind the door contained two or three letters the chill habit of living the life of an anchorite alone was one of the matters which honora in vain had combated the room never had a welcome for the girl when she entered it it was always necessary to warm and light it and to coax out some semblance of comfort by efforts of her own but lucilla pressed the sharpness of any deprivation voluntarily to her own heart it made her think she was simplifying herself paring away the luxurious habit created by a vicious civilization and getting nearer to a share in the life of the people on this occasion she took the letters from the box and threw them on a corner table without looking at them and then proceeded with the usual business of lighting the fire and preparing her meal 
and at last the room was bright and the kettle steaming on the hob then she changed her dress and finally sat down to tea a touch of austerity in her treatment of herself held her off her letter-reading or was it a prolongation of her pleasure for to one whose days were thin and meagre and full of aching needs such communications with the outside world were the deepest satisfaction the joy of them spreading not only over hours but over days an envelope containing a few words even of friendly interest how much it was what thrills of life and colour it brought not until every trace of her meal was cleared away and the room brightened up for the evening did the girl approach the table on which the real feast was spread that letter on the top was nothing special she turned it over beneath lay a square greyish coloured envelope the very look of which was inviting and friendly thick too as though a couple of sheets at least might be covered with handwriting conveying news thoughts kindness and perhaps a little rallying laughter the writing on the envelope was paul's when she saw it her hand darted covetously out and covered it a snatch of greed in the fingers her hungry heart leaping as a half-starved thing at sight of a meal the room was dizzy suddenly with life with colour with sound a pleasant excitement beat in her ears and agitated her breast to her lone corner of existence so landlocked so rock-bound flowed again the greater tide drawing in through tiny apertures its salt and tonic wave to refresh the rifts where unregarded mosses be she raised the packet eagerly then her fingers suddenly relaxed and her eyes closed under a frown she dropped the envelope as quickly as she had gathered it up and threw both hands over her face for her will cried out to her no 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 a step back was precisely the step that she never would take it was her resolve to close all avenues that opened from the past her judgment of paul sheridan the parliamentary member being unchanged the tumult into which the sight of his handwriting had thrown her with its agitating reminder of the happy bygone days was over as suddenly as it had come she snatched the letter up a second time turned towards the fire and thrust it unopened into the flame when it was consumed she gave a sigh of relief as though she had escaped a danger three weeks went by and it was now december the month in its early opening was mild but the weather prophets foretold the approach of excessive cold late one soft and pleasant evening lucilla came out of the shabby house in the street beyond westminster bridge after a couple of hours spent in the society of the anarchist companions the occasion had been an ordinary one and she was turning homewards without any special emotion either of interest or excitement d'auvernay was with her it had grown to be an unspoken custom between them that he should accompany her a part of the way home she did not care that it should be so but he was persistent and in her aching loneliness she suffered his companionship he was far older than herself he was she had reasons to believe a married man and his presence gave on occasion at least a comforting sense of protection usually he amused and interested her with talk to-night he was silent they had almost crossed the bridge before he spoke then he suddenly bent down towards her miss dennison said he in a low voice i have something important to communicate to you so fraught with significance was his tone that lucilla stopped dead on the pavement not here said he hastily but can you spare me a moment will you come with me now and grant me an interview in some secluded spot where said lucilla startled and awed by the immense gravity which he had thrown into his voice i know a quiet spot on the embankment beyond the houses of parliament we can stand there leaning on the wall and looking over into the water no one will molest us and d'auvernay accepting her unspoken consent took a step in advance and walked on quietly as though leading the way lucilla drew her long cloak more tightly about her and followed closely her heart began to beat in subdued excitement the two passed under the shadow of the house of commons that place so condemned in the judgment of either 
and turned by the railings to the left the jostling of passengers here sensibly diminished but in the most thronged part lucilla had been unconscious of it she threaded her way amongst her fellows in a singular absorption her heart fixed on that strange romance which it had accepted in preference to any other and her senses closed to ordinary sights and sounds the great pile of westminster the bridge and river the moving procession of the streets all were tinctured by the same hue all were beheld through the predominant mystification of anarchism felt through that touched through that no passing face but responded in some way to her exalted entente condition no trifling event but was in her excited fancy an omen summoning her to proceed un voyage de mille lieues commence par un pas et tous ses compagnons il n'y a que le premier pas qui écoute those were words she had been reading that evening dully without inspiration as it seemed to her now but they returned to her memory illumined passing under the shadow of the house of lords her eye flashed its scorn on the bricks and mortar her tread became firmer her spirit fiercer she followed in magnificent assurance and to the eye of her mind the fate before her trailed a purple and royal robe d'auvernay led on until they came to a part where the coming and going of men comparatively speaking ceased on one side a wide road was a row of pleasant houses on the other a wall and beneath it the noiseless beautiful flow of the river here said he suddenly coming to a halt then he leaned against the wall and turned his head to the river lucilla approached and stood near him the tones of their voices could be caught by no one the immense feeling of grave adventure of great fate intoxicated the girl heart and brain more deeply than before mademoiselle said he in a sudden rough voice close to her ear are you staunch surely monsieur d'auvernay surely you do not distrust me ah uh, would that be possible no i do not distrust you if i had distrusted you should i have brought you here i am staunch monsieur d'auvernay but you are so slight a creature so mignon petite have you strength i am strong said lucilla with conviction but these are rough matters too great too grave for shoulders so slight and graceful as yours they are things for men alone for women too if they touch life but it is bitter dangerous action is different from talk it is pleasant to speak of action in the circle of the comrades to pass the word to dream but to come out from them mademoiselle with the mind fixed on its lonely intention to set oneself to do a deed for liberty for the people ah monsieur d'auvernay is it going to be as great as that she clasped her hands with a swift natural movement and her voice thrilled had you not better go away now without hearing the rest he pursued in a voice partly mocking partly tender for it is as great as that as great as that his dark eyes darted to hers and held them a soft subdued shadow made the splendid irises more beautiful lucilla's eyes wide open clear as stars stared into them come said he still with that deep dark gaze i warn you you had better not listen a slow immense movement of the heart in her breast answered to her prevision that the dream of the last few years of her life was about to be realized the physical feeling rose upwards to her brain and there was a rushing sound in her ears her own frame seemed far too slight to sustain the idea which had made so sudden an inroad upon her and now seemed to possess her like some spirit that was not her own she put out her hand to the wall to steady herself go on said she breathlessly come nearer turn to the river lucilla obeyed to her wild fancy the whisper close to her ear was coloured crimson and had an edge 
it is not customary to us to confide in others least of all to entrust our affairs to a woman our convictions are our guides our acts are not deliberated they are performed only strong souls can go with us i know it but when the occasion comes when we see that the time is ripe for a far-reaching action then if help be needed we greatly dare throwing ourselves on our faith in the hearts of the companions yes and now the time is ripe we have to hasten mademoiselle because humanity can wait no longer we languish for want of a deed an example if we are to advance a leap to the heart of things must be taken i am weary that we should stand still so long and suffer the people to perish in battalions from the systematized oppression of officialism and greed we are fainting because of corruption within our own ranks the socialists have deserted us they have moved to the enemy's side and are cousining the people with official lies beneath her cloak lucilla's two hands tightly bound themselves upon her swelling heart even amidst our own immediate comrades there is deviation fair speech curtailment a new departure is necessary it has been prepared it is ready from the moment itself it takes its spring if we are not to lose sight of ourselves we must leap forward and plant our ruthless banner of the revolution in the citadel a deed mademoiselle a deed is necessary yes yes what are you then one of us i am oh i am staunch do you infer what is coming scarcely go on if you saw freedom a renovated world behind would you fear the momentary crash the thunders of falling states no no it is what i desire can you bear it small slight thing can you endure i have told you to proceed the night was full of the swift dialogue the air bore it off in reverberations and the river carried it several great cities are in it poissy lyon lille marseilles madrid paris of course and london ah the ground the houses the very air reeled london is the heart of the movement here is its birthplace from here the other great centres are moved her lips opened but without sound you believe in the strength of the people their irresistible might once they are aroused yes if i tell you the fates of your comrades their life their death will be in your hands lucilla's eyes closed god knows what emotion sees the poor little maidenly heart with its dreams its cold purity its fire spot of passion its wild capacity and hunger for self-devotion my fate our fates added d'auvernay they will be safe but have you still more courage can you go a step further can you act was it then possible she was called on to come forward her head drooped for a moment the emotion she was under was almost intolerable you require my assistance yours and no others there was deep silence between them you are the single woman he whispered as it was prolonged still she did not reply gazing across the river she saw the dim piles of buildings and the lights and the long reflections through a strange luminous mist that hovered before her eyes a hurried step went by a hansom dashed past the noise of the city hovered everywhere and there were cries from the boats on the water a strange cold mournful sense of finality of eternal adieu fell upon her the earth gladness passed for ever from her spirit her eyes were moistened for one moment suddenly she turned her pure innocent face stretched out her snowflake hand and laid it in that of the foreigner without a word his eyes leaped you give yourself yes and i am glad but her voice was faint can you take a journey suddenly honora the school strange incongruities floated into her mind 
they seemed as thin apparitions only the ordinary duty to which she was pledged shrivelled as worthless tinder in a furnace yes said she when must it be this is sunday i could make every preparation for thursday night it must be thursday and not later i will be ready if you require money he began she took a step backwards and shook her head for the passage i meant he said hastily across the channel you comprehend monsieur d'auvernay not out of england ah mademoiselle not alone no no not alone with protection and companionship near you i do not understand where am i going and what for d'auvernay pressed near until his breath was on her cheek he paused as though to gather force and then his voice broke from him in a stormy whisper every syllable of which was tipped with long repressed passion what for because you are the heart of me because you fit me as the dagger fits the sheath because you are my courage my inspiration my soul because i cannot act without you without you i cannot bring it through i am not understanding said lucilla sharply she was bewildered horrified attracted in one breath all this is as it may be speak more plainly for i do not understand d'auvernay laughed softly it was a beautiful musical laugh that seemed to pervade her looking at him his face showed as a splendid thing luminous with smiles and with a strange new something that never in her life had she beheld before why why in the immense gravity of this moment did m d'auvernay smile and look like that her delicate lids suddenly shut in the dim light the soft cold virginity that lay about the brows and lips the high reserve the cloistral something that set her all apart seized on the man's heart and fired him to an emotion that was savage in its intensity that and the inexplicable freedom of her brave english manners foredoomed to misreading by eyes that had for years perused a voluptuous page in a prim binding a licentious print stolen as it were between the rigid boards of a missal is it possible that you have not guessed that you have not seen that i have chosen you small fragile heroic girl out of all women to move with me to the great purpose ah but you have seen you have known can you or i ever forget that evening when you came to me voluntarily mademoiselle unasked when you condescended to yourself throw yourself upon my society my tuition my guidance then was it that i first felt the free beat of your exquisite heart near mine knew that you had broken your bonds and were free that the long coveted thing was in reach for do you not see he came nearer her lucilla raised her hand with a strange movement and brushed it across her eyes as though some thin confusing web hung there the air around her was whirling with whispers and circles of light for do you not see he repeated that you are the heart of me that with you the true inspiration began in your charming impulsiveness you won me but i was yours before you rule me mademoiselle i am a child to your slightest touch i have envied the cloak that enfolded you the wind that lifted your hair and brought the colour to your cheek ah that cheek that lovely mouth monsieur d'auvernay no no do not speak yet your mouth was created to be gazed at worship touched it is there mademoiselle to fill a man's veins with fire and nerve him to his task without you i am nothing with you in my arms i can dare defy act not i alone for great cities await your consent all those threads on which mighty destinies depend converge to a single point that lies in your hand your hand so small so fine so delicate yet so strong for till you bid me move i will not move 
till you give yourself to me i shall be nothing till your lovely mouth surrenders itself i am incapable my arms ache for you my nature craves you see i give you my heart my hands my worship my all good god was this this the meaning of the moment this outrage from that fair height was the descent so swift so deep for the first time in her life in the very moment of her high exaltation of feeling lucilla was reduced to the merest sense of sex condemned to listen to a bare solicitation of a kind hitherto unshaped to her imagining stop the voice struggled as through some physical obstruction he had thrown himself towards her and she had retreated a step her action her cry shook out of him a new storm of words in the whirl of his whispers and the extremity of her repulsion it was only by a supreme effort that she kept her balance sufficiently to understand that each sentence of passion was pointed by a hint of some ominously rash adventure to follow upon this stormy scene but as regards herself the prose of the situation stole with intolerable clearness upon her cooling fancy she was in the eyes of this man no maid of france selected to bear forwards the banner of revolt but simply an intoxicating draught to his own lips the froth to his courage the stimulating bite before action that was her part and this the proposition to which the prelude had been played in so sounding a key dwindled to such dimensions she saw herself suddenly from the shameful eyes of another wait she cried again her voice was thin weak inadequate that immense emotion which had brought her into the situation and which had lent its elation to her courage even to the point of self-betrayal was extinguished of all the fever and strain the aspiration and wild expectation and romance nothing was left it had burnt out like a coloured fireball leaving her suddenly cold small sane but once her foot on solid earth again her keen brain began to trace its way amid the ruin of things to sort to test to determine its own attitude and to take up its own plan with a cold mournful realization of the safety of limitation in a world whose fruition turned to ashes at her disastrous touch it was still possible to throw oneself back upon the eternal sense of justice to retreat within the hidden fortress of the spiritual and entrench one's own petty failure behind that enshrouding greatness she told herself with sharp self-flagellating truth that in justice she could not blame this man he stood for his principle and no point of his action but was logically derived from it for the rest her nearest and main refuge was her english training the orderliness and just balance of her daily habit she felt it return to her from the remotest reach of her being rising up within her and asserting itself to the utter and complete extinction of all other feeling the night partook of the change this was a road she stood upon those were houses of brick and mortar that a sluggish not over clean river and she once more herself i ask you to wait her foot stamped imperiously on the pavement d'auverney folded his arms and bent his head it is well she said dryly to put things of this kind clearly this is a personal bargain i perceive am i to understand that you are asking me to accompany you on a journey out of england immediately that i am to go with you on thursday to paris and with my love you ask me to accompany you in what capacity as my well-beloved my most cherished as your wife or what if thus you name it and what becomes cried lucilla with sudden inspiration of your real wife of the present madame d'auverney d'auverney unfolded his arms and looked at her in quiet surprise what has that to do with the question said he who told you that i have a wife i know it said lucilla briefly just so he replied calmly all is clear between us there was a long silence no words could have stung deeper and the venom was that they were true the situation was to him not her as for d'auverney he was too versed in conquest to be either impatient or to doubt the issue he simply waited until she should thrill him again by voluntarily laying her pretty hand in his 
the piquant thing about it from the beginning had been the impulsive charming tenders that lucilla herself had made those free-taking manners of hers which if common to english women must make courtship indeed a pleasant thing to english gentlemen he devoured her face and figure with his eyes and awaited the intense pleasure of her genial compliance meanwhile lucilla's wit travelled quick ways of its own the shock was too intense not to prove stimulating and the swift self-flagellation it brought with it once more steadied her on justice there was a certain measure of hard simple sense in d'auvernay's last words and the heart of pride within her frightful humiliation rooted itself on that she moistened her dry lips if all is clear between you and me said she slowly it is probably hardly clear between yourself and your wife i trust mademoiselle said d'auvernay quickly that you will not permit an affair long dead to prejudice my present suit her ears shrank was she so cheap a thing as that the hard self-flagellating instinct kept her sane and to her point your wife she repeated a woman to whom you gave a pledge when i met madame d'auvernay said the frenchman i had not met you love cannot be bound you hesitate over a trifle it does credit to your fineness of heart there is a legal tie between myself and a woman to whom i am indifferent i do not recognize the law my affection being dead the tie is over it is nothing you mistake returned lucilla i recognize the tie in all probability your wife does too mademoiselle said d'auvernay speaking with an accent of obvious sincerity what is that woman to me that i should consider her love that is dead is dead you cannot revive a corpse and is your conscience so far legalized that you suppose the law of this matter could be binding on me for one second lucilla paused again there had even been surprise in his tone she noted it and understood again she pressed the point against herself justice hard cold salutary should be meted out he was simply true to his principles he was saying nothing but what had been included in his teaching from the beginning there was not a word that was not logical and written down in the premise she had of her own voluntary act by accepting his dogma cut from herself all standpoint from which she could logically upbraid despise or revile him the whole thing was astoundingly clear to her mind now and yet the difference between the coloured obfuscation of yesterday and the intolerable light of this moment was that then the talk had been general and in the air now it was a personal application it is not the legal tie of which i think said lucilla in the same thin quiet voice but have you no feeling of doubt when you consider what your wife your deserted wife may suffer no feeling of honour to a pledge given i am not one he said with a kind of cold glow in his eyes to potter with doubts and mess with honour honour is your conscience enslaved to such a conventional bit of humbug i thank my maker i carry within me no such sickly admonisher my conscience is my will to preserve myself in life and joy and action monsieur d'auvernay said lucilla we must end this conversation there has been some terrible misunderstanding it is not you i blame it is myself my conscience is so bound by that conventional bit of humbug that i am not even able to thank you for your offer the bitterness of her humiliation escaped her in those words she turned to go only however to find herself confronted once more by the same storm of passion by that face luminous with an emotion that offended and sickened her and by the added sense of fear which a new note of savagery in the man's voice brought with it you are not going mademoiselle said he threateningly assuredly we have not explained ourselves we are comrades mademoiselle not children playing at love you placed your hand in mine you were under a vow this is but a prelude to the great event the vow of secrecy i made i will keep god help me i am a weak woman i have come to a great stress monsieur d'auvernay your aspect your manner terrify and disgust me that was the horrible part of it the gentle courteous companion was transformed to some incalculable mischief to an unruled unguided force that flung itself upon her there he stood before her 
an incarnate impulse that acknowledged no law save itself that was its own god its own religion she felt without hearing them his whirling words they rained upon her as shapeless inarticulate sounds she only knew that they stained and broke and defiled her that an extremity of humiliation was meted out to her and that all the habitual reticences of her mind and nature the walled garden and sanctuary of her soul was trampled down as with the hoofs of some coarse satyr it was in her mind to shriek for help against this horror this horror always rimmed by his ghastly claim upon her but when she essayed it her throat and tongue were powerless there are words that are brutal as blows tones that are insults looks that are indignities and always and always that ghastly claim that hint of her voluntary surrender she made a rush past him he laid his hand upon her his touch was loathsome to her sense as a reptile's her heart seemed to swoon within her when she felt it the repulsion in her feeling was something physically overpowering she felt herself swaying there was a great black horror and the detested handsome luminous face following her down into it the words that escaped her lips in a sobbing moan broke from her unconsciously oh paul she cried oh paul won't you save me that perjured traitor that betrayer of the cause you called to him the bitter venom and hate of the tones penetrated to her ear from some far place and stung her back to life they seemed to snatch her suddenly out of her careful self-restraint and throw her into some unknown unexperienced region of emotion her feet her veins became fire she did not feel her body it was gone she was a single wild force of inspired and supreme fury a mere piece of hot and instant vengeance she wrenched herself free a voice poignant ringing scarcely her own rushed from her it is you who betray and darting forwards with a sharp upward spring and with her fist clenched she struck slight small thing that she was no inconsiderable blow at the detested face the next moment she was flying with blinding speed in the direction of the safe and noisy turmoil of the streets End of chapter twenty chapter twenty one of transition this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org transition by emma francis brooke chapter twenty one like a pierced air ball lucilla's illusion had collapsed all night she lay with wide open eyes and motionless body while wave after wave of shame and agony passed over her an excessive wound had been dealt to her sensitiveness only when all the written or unspoken social rules that had erected an invisible fortress around her within which her delicate girlhood had moved and acted brave and free as a lad is only when these were destroyed did she realize their existence and her defencelessness without them against the brutal tyranny of individualistic lawlessness hitherto sex had meant to her simply one of the conditions and modalities of daily existence she had been scarcely conscious of it its meaning was now discovered to her not through some glorious passion revealing her possession of so sweet and dignified an attribute but through the cruelest humiliation every now and then a sigh of anguish escaped her she was faint and giddy under the blow i am killed she said i am killed i can never recover it never look with the same eyes again and at the same time her judgment repeated that this which had happened had been wrapped in the premise from the first beautiful possibility recondite loveliness exquisite aspiration might be there too but then so was this also this lawless permission of tyrannous outrage by one individual will on another when morning came after the sleepless darkness her mind was able to stir a little under its weight of humiliation the pane of her window from which the curtain was drawn back showed a grey bit of sky from which a mingled shower of sleet and rain fell on the roofs and chimneys the temperature of the air had sunk suddenly 
and it was as piercingly raw and cold this morning as it had been close and warm last night lucilla dragged herself out of bed and began her dressing operations halfway through them she lit her fire the growing warmth of the room and her own movements acted as a stimulus and suddenly her memory took up the thread of last night's event at that constant hint of d'auvernay's of some conspiracy a-brewing and then she recalled the promise of secrecy she had given lucilla dropped her brush upon her knee and sat very still a frown upon her brow how was she to know that this contemplated action which she had pictured as a great simultaneous rising of the people in the cities named was a popular bid for liberty at all and not a mere individual outrage such as her sharp lesson of the night before had taught her was possible ought she to keep that vow which she had made or ought she to break it and inform the doubt and the question were alike frightful and far beyond her present mental capacity to resolve she threw herself back in her chair and closing her eyes tried to find her way out of the shocking trap into which she had stepped the thought of paul brought her a momentary hope which was as instantly erased it was impossible to write to paul or any other man she had lost her bearings in life and could not find the old unconscious freedom of her former attitude the change was in herself now tears of anguish slow scarce drops stole down her cheeks i cannot write i am broken she whispered her next move was to spring from her chair and hurry on her dressing if she was to keep her sanity she must escape from these overwhelming thoughts into some cheerful human society honora's comfortable presence was the single refuge open to her and to that she fled the hour was so extremely early that lucilla reached the school before her friend had sat down to breakfast honora was moving about her bright and cheerful room opening letters and putting little things to rights when lucilla suddenly slipped in at the door why you strange quiet sweet little mouse cried honora whom instinct led to be lavish of tender epithets to lucilla how did you get here i just came said lucilla fighting for a smile have you had breakfast lucilla started and faintly coloured no when i come to think of it i haven't honestly i forgot hm said honora stamping her foot let me feel your hands down you sit by the fire at once i'm going to take off your boots bit of a thing you are trembling come nestle up was there ever such a piece of errant foolery let me see your eyes not my eyes honora dear probably you have been shedding tears over the woes of the east end and starving yourself by way of setting the balance straight if i could only induce you to leave the world's misery to stronger shoulders than your own mr sheridan's for instance and to stick to your own morsel of duty not that i would forbid you to help mr sheridan in a reasonable measure but do remember you are a woman yes said lucilla in a low voice that is the ghastly part of it ghastly fiddlesticks it is one of those facts that has to be looked well in the face and then forgotten mr sheridan's heart is no doubt a deep and kind one though i consider him on the whole detestable and have every reason for supposing he feels the world's misery as much as you do but men's nerves don't lie on the surface they carry the burden of life lightly and throw off impressions more easily the very fact that they don't cry when they are tired or when any one speaks roughly to them marks a permanent difference when things go cross with them they play billiards and smoke and score anyhow now we creep away and sob honora was stooping on one knee by lucilla's side she had lucilla's foot on the other knee and was unlacing the boot lucilla stole a long covetous look at the bent head with its rippling dark hair if only she had not repressed her yearning to lay bare to honora's quizzical eyes and temperate nature her own confused story but her mind had been too long off the balance to permit her to lay hold of common sense now and to drop her personal perplexity into the genial stream of indifferent events 
now there's all this bother about emancipation continued honora i went in for that once you know and of course i'm all for clearing away our disabilities now including stays and tears if it can be compassed but the fact is lucilla i discovered the very moment i had found a work that suited me and set to doing it that i was emancipated now you taught me that bit of wisdom you instructed me in the effectiveness of revolving in one's own circle constantly instead of taking a meteoric course yes said lucilla there the boots are off at last said honora rising i don't know how it is lucilla but the sight of you stirs within me the prevision that i am a born mother a caterer for a tableful of hungry naughty children with my mind on jams and consolation i am glad you are small it makes it more dignified and fitting that i should kiss you thus squeeze you in my arms this way as though you were a child you are a child lucilla i never saw such inveterate babyhood on any other face such a singular and inconvenient and abject innocence of contour oh i know everything now she lifted up her face with her scared eyes wide open again it was on the tip of her tongue to make wise confession do you indeed everything i should imagine bonny face exquisite little mortal i feel something between a clumsy giantess and a wise matriarch beside you i don't know what that word means and believe i invented it otherwise it is historical perhaps leslie says i am weak in history what i mean by it is the feel don't you know at the bottom of your heart every time you realize the helplessness of a grown man to achieve his own salvation in details a sort of excruciated pity that so cumbrous an animal should be so constantly inadequate i believe we knew we were mothers before men knew they were men it's that which makes it inevitable that we should love them well i have very much the same sort of feeling towards you and your superior character and intellect honora was moving about now and looking after the breakfast coffee shall it be lucilla i mean to make it myself also hot toast muffins and more substantial viands arrived from below thin little hand i believe you are one of those women who expect to obtain greater refinement and clearness of thought by the simple process of starvation if women would but realize that nourishing food is the basis of right thinking i believe they would rescue themselves from absurdity am i absurd honora chronically so my sweetest lucilla honora yes is it my turn to take the english citizen class this week certainly it is my clever mite have you anything ready i thought i would speak to them upon the generalizing faculty have you observed a curious thing about women only too many my dear but we are in a conspiracy to paint the sex as perfection and to reserve our reviling for individual members i have no one to revile saving myself i am sad honora i want to tell the children through some simple lesson that women have two chief things to conquer in life one is the brain inertia that prevents them from ever making a generalization at all the other is the want of control of staying power that impels them if ever they do achieve a generalization to fling themselves headlong after it into some precipitate and fatal action honora's gaiety of manner concealed some very serious anxiety on lucilla's account she persuaded her friend to remain with her for the four following nights longer than that lucilla would not assent to then honora extracted a promise that before she went back to her flat she would send the key to a neighbour and at least have the room prepared and warmed for her return lucilla consented friday morning which was to see her termination of the week's school work stood out to her imagination shrouded in vague surmise d'auvernay would have reached paris by then a cloud of dismay and anxiety hung over her mind she would rather get back to her flat and meet the event alone meanwhile she concealed her feeling of illness and mental disturbance as well as she could from her friend and combated nervous attacks of terror by assiduous application to work honora took in a morning paper but rarely herself perused it the sight of it on the table at breakfast would steal from lucilla the possibility of swallowing her food and after breakfast she opened it with dread friday morning arrived here is the paper said honora pushing it towards her i never have time to read it the government will i dare say look after the country if i look after my school lucilla opened it there seemed nothing special in the foreign intelligence upon which her eye had instantly pounced 
she was turning the other pages listlessly when her attention was caught by a heading that instantly riveted it the evening before that is on the thursday sheridan in company with littleton had attended in the public gallery a sitting of the school board it was dark when they came out and first crossing to the river side of the embankment they turned their faces in the direction of westminster both of them noticed that under the arch near the offices of the thames conservancy the figure of a man was leaning neither of them remarked seeing they were walking in an opposite direction that he moved from his position as they approached and crossing the road in the direction from which they came kept pace with them upon the other side if they had happened to observe these movements neither would have attached meaning or importance to them they walked along in the negligent security habitual to persons who belonged to a comparatively speaking well-ordered city it had been snowing for a couple of days but for the moment the sky was clear and beautiful above the white-clad trees and houses they chose the riverside because of the quiet beauty of the scene and continued their walk along the embankment for the same reason the cold of the atmosphere was sensibly diminishing and a thaw was imminent at present however it was calm and beautiful enough to tempt them to stop and stand by the wall and look over the river and draw once more to their citizen hearts the never wearying feel of the great city as the thames and its embankments carry it sheridan in particular was saturated with the emotion of london in the daytime this emotion was done into the prose of his continuous labours for the city of his birth and love in the evening and rare moments at such an hour as this when she hung her lights above and around the river and shrouded her pinnacles and towers in a mystery and beauty that was something over and above their own in such a moment it affected him from that region of ideality and poetry which were strongly hidden in his imagination but which left a mark conspicuously in his eyes and on his brows it escaped him now in a sense of the vastness and quietness of this central scene of a city not yet asleep beneath the night and then of the vastness and quietness of unseen things above and beyond the turmoil of our best endeavour of the grand indifferent persistence that draws us on when we ourselves think that we are pulling a sigh escaped him i must hold to my own thought he as he felt that greater reach upon him to that little which i am able to see there had run through the dim places of his imagination a faint shudder a whisper of doubt it was not superstition it was the profound surmise of a strong intellect that the arrayed forces contain an incalculable remainder the tribute of a powerful mind to its own fallibility and of a splendid will to the small quiet something which is mightier than itself in such moments the character of sheridan's face changed it became the face of a virile man subduing himself to the strong correction of that impenetrable greatness which warns us of the subordination and smallness of ourselves it will all be spoiled to-morrow said littleton looking round him after the silence but it is perfect to-night the two walked on the dogging figure unobserved upon the other side until westminster bridge was reached here they crossed again and struck northwards let us go by parliament street in the park said sheridan there is plenty of time and it will be quieter their destination was spring gardens sheridan had an appointment at the offices of the county council and was proposing afterwards to spend the evening in the society of an ex-cabinet minister who wished to take his opinion upon a subject of which he was known to have a deeper acquaintance and more originality of thought than most men as they walked on sheridan suddenly took back a joyous militant bearing and broke out into his habitual raillery at the liberal party i'm sick at them said he they haven't it in them so far as i can make out to muster a programme they are looking about for an election cry in the stars with this misery infested city lying at their feet in effect they acknowledge that they can't think of anything to come before the country with save home rule welsh disestablishment and liquor one would think we had cleared everything up and were forced into imbecility for want of a job hardhead asked me to call to-night and have a talk on the rates question i'm willing enough but i mean to put in a word or two about the programme by the way they've got to accept mine if they can't think of one of their own but what are we to make of a set of men who stand for office and have to seek for their working ideas outside anywhere where there's a brain furnished enough to look about it i'm sick at the thing first they grope about for a programme 
then when some one outside has sketched one which has a little more to do with the interests of the majority of the voters than the behaviour of the moon and when they've got elected into power on a genuine cry payment of members and things of the kind which touch the heart of the question then to a dead certainty they'll drop it on they'll go pottering at something off the mark instead of promptly setting right half a dozen abuses that lie at the root of london's misery and which it is their privilege to be able to remedy from the different departments by so many strokes of the pen without applying to parliament at all they had turned into parliament street and were nearing the park here it was lonely and still no one was in the street that they could see save that moving figure on the other side of the road just then the man crossed over a little before them in the heat of conversation they hardly noticed him sheridan was on the inside of the path they were close on the man's heels now suddenly he turned round and made as though he had changed his mind and was in a violent hurry to return he pushed rudely against sheridan and in that moment the latter felt littleton throw the whole of his weight violently upon him so as to propel him to the right in the same instant a stinging burning pain in his left side forced from him a sharp scream and he stumbled forwards fainting on to the snow my god cried littleton i saw the knife in the man's hand after him some of you fellows he ran towards the park a big man with a bushy beard the road had appeared to be empty it was full now of hurrying people littleton was on his knees in the snow by paul's side and was gently endeavouring to turn him over some one lent him a hand the sight sickened him the knife was still in the wound round the blade near the haft was a piece of paper with an inscription upon it rendered illegible by the flow of blood i don't think he's badly hurt said a quiet voice near him i'm not a doctor but i know a little of these matters i'll help you to lift him the blow fell short of the mark somehow but it was a near squeak too i saw the man reiterated littleton and i saw him raise the knife there wasn't time to do anything but throw my friend forwards just so you saved him or so i believe the next few hours were a nightmare of misery to littleton in addition to the uncertainty about his friend was the sordid horror of the police inquiry littleton could throw no light upon the matter he could only repeat the story of the man's sudden movement to return of sheridan's absorption in his talk of the extraordinary swiftness of the blow and of his own impulse to divert the stroke from a vital part by thrusting his friend to the side with the man himself he had no acquaintance he was a complete stranger dark and wearing a bushy beard to the motive of the deed he was absolutely without a clue it was not until saturday evening that littleton was admitted to paul's sick-room the verdict of the doctors had been however favourable from the first the wound though painful was not dangerous the shock being probably the worst part of the matter that was the reason of their keeping the patient in strict seclusion the assault had taken place on thursday night on the saturday morning sheridan was sufficiently recovered to be able to reply to a few inquiries of the police who were still vainly searching for the assassin on the saturday evening at his urgent request littleton was admitted to his room littleton found him lying in bed white from loss of blood and weak though in no kind of danger are you pretty comfortable old fellow asked he tenderly pretty fair it bites a bit of course but i don't know exactly why i'm lying here except that the doctors will have it so i'm forbidden to talk or to read or to think i believe for the present i'm to do nothing but lie and heal up it won't be long so they tell me it's a mere trifle just a little patience required i expect they'll let me come in and sit with you now and then i fancy yes thanks did you see that paper what paper littleton looked a little startled the paper through which the knife was thrust the police called for evidence about it this morning i had to see them well you see they have deciphered it they showed it to me the inscription was to the traitor littleton to whom have i been a traitor lord knows old fellow i don't nor i expect does any one who is in full possession of his senses a slight smile hovered over sheridan's lips well he said my own opinion is that our friend is an uncommonly acute fellow and knew particularly well what he was about he they have no bigger foe than i am in england the chief commissioner of police he added still with half-veiled amusement is not in it with me you have a clue then sheridan you see pursued the latter calmly when a fellow sticks a knife into you you naturally look up to inquire before going under i did so and i saw the man's eyes plainly above the false beard and recognized him i don't know if i must say as much as that he was 
safe out of england you may be certain before i was well enough to be questioned littleton considered a little and will never come back again i believe said he after a pause i think i follow you now but he is caught on another count it appears he went to paris he went there on business of a sort and he was prompt at it too the chamber of deputies or something on a great scale is supposed to have been his object unfortunately what he carried about him had to be disposed of hastily before the time or he lost his nerve or something went wrong and he threw his bomb too soon any one hurt a nursemaid carrying a baby so much of the bourgeoisie as may have been comprehended in a single infant in arms has i am afraid perished a few windows have been broken in addition and the police caught their man i am sorry to hear this poor d'auvernay the man did not understand the meaning of the idea at the back of his own mind that was why it wrecked him i believe i can follow it better than he did i believe i see the reach of it ever so much clearer than he i have never denied the fineness in it the idea of the anarchist is a right sort of leaven it is when it gets into the wrong hands that it becomes damnable and absurd i hate to hear of a man experiencing defeat like this d'auvernay was sincere enough in all conscience and besides when he struck at me he showed himself sagacious i can forgive a man much on that count i stand as the biggest foe of anarchism in england because i understand it d'auvernay is perspicacious at least a lesser man would have struck at the home secretary or chief commissioner of police paul lay silent for a moment then he added in a gentle voice i think you and i need not add our little bit of information to the sum of things against the poor fellow honestly i had not put two and two together when the police called this morning we'll just lie low shall we and so the thing was in to-day's paper just so paul lay silent presently he turned his head wearily to the wall it was the only movement permitted him at present littleton was excruciated to detect the signs of agitation in his face he touched his hand kindly i won't stay now said he tenderly you'd better be quiet when you've picked up a little more i'll come and act as amanuensis and that kind of thing paul suddenly opened his eyes i have a message to send said he it isn't at all urgent but i should like to give it while i remember all right what is it when shall you call at miss kemble's to-morrow probably i usually go there on sundays can i do anything for you if you should see lucilla lucilla is not there on sunday she would be on monday if i went then monday will do if you should see her tell her from me that i am all right scarcely hurt a bit say that it is a trifle and that i shall soon be well and about again very well i shall not forget i will call at the school on monday thanks that will do is it a cold night horrible all yesterday it thawed and to-day is a black and miserable frost End of chapter twenty one chapter twenty two of transition this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org transition by emma frances brooke chapter twenty two on the friday afternoon of the day on which an account of the assault on sheridan had appeared in the paper lucilla returned to her flat all morning by a stupendous act of will she had attended to her duties and retained a show of composure her hope being that by so doing she might escape honora's tender vigilance and get back unquestioned to the lonely place where she could best fight her agonizing thoughts and so well had she succeeded in her efforts that even honora was deceived and permitted her departure for the week end with rather less anxiety and reluctance than was usual it was shocking weather a thaw had set in after three days snow and it was accompanied by rain and every raw chill evil of the atmosphere lucilla whose feeling of exhaustion in both mind and body had been steadily increasing was drenched before she reached her destination her cloak and skirts were dripping and her feet wet as she painfully toiled up the stairs to her flat a woman to whom 
on honora's insistence she had confided the office of preparing and warming her room came out and returned her the key and inquired if any further services were needed lucilla her mind preoccupied by her supreme need to conceal her misery shook herself into an ordinary manner summoned a smile to her face and forgetful that her flat was entirely unfurnished with food paid the woman off on the spot and assured her that she should require no further attention for days to come then she continued her slow progress to the topmost story in the building and having entered her rooms closed and locked the door behind her a fire blazed on the hearth the girl had scarcely force left to unhook her cloak and let it fall from her shoulders that accomplished she dropped wearily to the floor leaning her head back against the wall in an attitude of complete exhaustion she was deadly white her eyes were closed her features drawn and her hands palms upwards lay listlessly by her side effort was indeed finally extinguished in that of passive suffering she was as incapable of thinking as of movement wave after wave of formless misery passed over her she knew what had happened without being able to set the event in a single articulated phrase how long she lay in this condition of collapse she did not know when she came to something like consciousness again she found that the fire was a dim glow in the grate and that dusk was gathering her feet and limbs were cold and numb and a feeling of deadly weakness almost precluded the idea of freeing herself from the wet boots and skirts that still encumbered her as to her misery all she recalled of it was that thinking had proved a task beyond her that for hours she must have lain there without making one inch of progress in the solution of some sickening mental problem a dim urgent feeling that the problem was still there was effectual to arouse her she dragged herself to her feet and noted with a faint sense of surprise that her body was full of severe pain the sharpness of it made it a stupendous effort to get across the room and to place more fuel on the fire and rekindle it to a blaze but the extreme cold she experienced compelled her at least to this endeavour the kettle was she believed full of water but then she remembered there was no food in the flat and that she had forbidden the woman to call and look after her and that finally she had locked herself in the question of food did not however disturb her for the very idea of it was nauseating she lit a couple of candles and then painfully freed herself from her wet garments sinking down in a low chair after the effort she thrust her bare feet to the blaze and tried in this way to bring back feeling into them by and by the greater degree of physical comfort sent the frozen blood a little quicker through her veins and into the confused miserable mental blackness a clear thought penetrated ah she said it is paul who is hurt paul who was trying to do his duty to men it is paul i am thinking about that is what this weight on my brain means there is something i have to say to him she rose from her seat and reached her blotting-case and a pencil from the bureau but no sooner had she sunk back on the chair than the blankness seemed to return to her mind she held the pencil suspended but found herself unable to trace a word she recalled what her intention had been but there was scarcely anything beyond that then she got up again placed the paper and pencil on a little stand by the side of the bed and the two candles with it after that she piled more fuel on the fire and then panting for breath fighting for each new effort weeping from sheer pain she finished her undressing if i can only get into bed she thought and lie still and get warm my mind will come back to me there is something about paul something that i have to remember and say to him 
at last the agonizing efforts were over and she was lying down in the warm light of fire and candle only however to sink again to the condition of semi-collapse it may be that eventually she slept at least she passed into a land of nightmare and distracting visions from this in the early hours of the morning she waked in indescribable misery not only was the weight on her spirits the sense of intolerable and crushing anguish heavier than before but her head and limbs were tortured with increased pain whereupon she knew that she was ill ill here in the workman's flat on a saturday morning and with every chance of assistance carefully excluded by her own hand at least i shall be undisturbed said she her lips were parched and body cold the fire and the candles had long burnt out and though the means of rekindling both and of procuring water for herself lay to her hand it was impossible even to raise her head from the pillow she fell again into a troubled half delirious doze which was all mingled with the confused misery of the day before that misery touched paul it was intimately connected with the idea of him but then what was it every thought reached and strove after him and failed always at the solution as though a hand wiped it from her brain oh my friend my friend was all her moaning thought and nothing further after that came a deep sleep and with it an appalling dream it was not earth any longer but some spiritual region where judgment reigned and paul was there she dreamed that he was an apostate and that he was condemned by the spirits of the just she dreamed that it was she herself who pointed the first finger of accusation at him and in her dream she thought that by the act she won high heaven for herself and that heaven thus won was more horrible than the lowest hell the horror waked her she found the daylight in her room and knew that it must be far into saturday morning the weather had cleared and it promised to be bright but the light hurt her and the things on which her eyes rested were terrible though she recognized in them the ordinary furniture of her chamber and strove to reason herself into tranquillity one object seriously alarmed and perplexed her beyond her somewhere between the bed and the wall rising from and surrounded by a nebulous mist she saw the profile of sheridan it was clear and distinct in outline and colouring but was cold and enigmatical as a sphinx it had been less terrible if it had turned and looked at her but it gazed immovably at vacancy this strange illusion terrified her spirit and she turned her head on the pillow and closed her lids my brain is disordered she thought this is illness no more if i shut my eyes for a long time what i see will vanish she kept them closed while her heart thumped and tumbled in her breast then after an intolerable interval she opened them timidly and anxiously the profile was still there her alarm and uneasiness acted as a stimulus to her brain she remembered the intended letter and her own extreme anxiety to write it by a supreme effort she got her hand out of bed stretched it to the stand by her side and secured both paper and pencil then knowing nothing clearly of the subject of her proposed missive she traced slowly and painfully the words dear paul forgive there were other ineffectual tracings but the paper and the pencil dropped from her hands and even the memory of her confused intention was effaced her thought wandered to honora what would she not have given to have heard her step upon the stair to have seen her strong kind face at the door the brown eyes full of love what would she not have given to be touched by her hands her mind dwelt upon the memory of honora until the contrast heightened the present desolation to too intolerable an anguish and she sought refuge from it in the more familiar grief and discomfort she had been lying with her head averted she turned it and sought again timidly for the strange illusion which embodied as she knew some tremendous but inexplicable grief it was still there immovable and in the same posture her eyes rested on it in something between terror 
and satisfaction for at least the features were those of a friend all day it went on thus once she seemed to herself to swoon into a great darkness from which she was snatched back by a voice that cried loudly in her ears one of you shall betray me she woke up her heart beating suffocatingly and could see no trace of any living thing the long terrible lonely hours went on and on no one came save once the milkman his loud knock and cry shook her out of a doze she had an agonizing desire for a draught of milk and strove to call to him but even had she been able to make her voice loud enough to reach him he was whistling and rattling his cans and she had no chance his retreating foot was the next thing she heard and the milk he had left behind the door was as much out of her reach as though he had never brought it at that for a moment she cried helplessly then she recalled how this which had happened to her was an accident she was not really forsaken not absolutely destitute as those are who have not the love to turn to even had they the power the thought of honora came back once more with supreme consolation it was no longer a pain it was a help to think of her thus and thus it would have been could honora have known of her suffering and then she thought of paul the friend whose calmer but unvaried kindness had covered years of her life an immediate and sudden realization of what had happened followed upon that the renewed shock might have extinguished the little flutter of living activity that had returned to her brain save that the thought of his kindness his utter incapacity for malice or for harboured resentment was uppermost in her mind and then a cry for forgiveness trembled from her lips and in her fancy her cry was met and covered by an instant and warm assurance of pardon it must be so for such was the nature of paul she thought how the threshold of this door of desolate suffering had been trodden by human feet before and that the way had been sharper to the steps she was not alone that supported her to her the thought of sharing anything human however bitter could bring majestic tranquillity an austere consolation descended upon her breast and brought it peace after that the sound of her own voice the conviction of having uttered incoherent words startled her she concluded that she was getting worse and that her brain was more disordered and that all power and self-control might leave her the cold she suffered and the parching dryness were something inconceivable and pain held her as in a vice she knew now that following upon days of exhaustion over-excitement and weakness she was stricken with the prevailing plague of influenza nothing else could account for the fever the shivering and the extreme weakness she calculated that sunday intervening honora would not miss her from the school until the day following but she was convinced that on her non-appearance on monday morning her friend would surmise that something was wrong and would come to inquire monday afternoon when school was over was then the earliest that relief could reach her how near was she to that in her fever she had lost count of time time and eternity were one and then she remembered that honora might not be disturbed by her non-appearance at first she might not send she might wait to hear something that last clear thought was again too much for her weakened brain at the point she fell into delirium and the chilly silence was disturbed by rapid incoherent talk of which she herself was unaware this was followed by a season of quietude and blank unconsciousness hours passed and she lay absolutely motionless from this condition she waked at last the room was still as a vault and as black she herself was a little blot of feeling in the midst of an appalling darkness at first she thought it was night and then she dimly surmised that the silence and the darkness were in herself by a tremendous effort she raised her lids to ascertain it made no difference now said she with a deep thrill this is death 
i feel more than i have ever felt before but i am blind and deaf soon the feeling will go too death that appeared to signify the intensest expectation the loud laboured thumping of her heart it seemed to tumble loosely in her breast was rather a sensation than a sound it was the only pain she felt the thing seemed leaping with an agonising fear which she herself did not share for amidst that physical convulsion her thoughts were tranquil and clear she was certain of death's approach and she reflected that in this life all her precious things her most delicate and refined things the heart's core of her ruthless truth had been rejected misunderstood she thought of it tearlessly yet no martyr in a russian prison suffered more she was tearless because she recognized in it a certain fitness a certain inevitableness even a commonness of experience i shall die she said and it is best for me to go god knows i was sincere but i did not understand the time nor the time me some of the things i thought i still believe my tremendous error was to dream that truth is single i am a woman whose mind was pitched out of its own era it is well to die now if i had lived i should have been ground to powder it came to her with compelling clearness as she lay there with her face sharpening thinning paling and sinking into the pillow her brave clear faith and ennobling tenderness had squandered themselves upon the impossible mercy itself could not have saved her except by death only she did not belong to her age meanwhile the coldness gathered it was different from the cold of the fever this was still and deadly even that sensation was extinguished at last and the thumping of the heart grew less and less she thought she was falling somewhere the bright sunshine of monday noonday poured into the room in vain for her darkened eyes it illumined the neglected dust-covered furniture and the dead ashes in the grate and lay upon the little white bed across the corpse-like figure with its sinking outline and the sharp face whose only sign of life were the little puffs of laboured breath that escaped at longer and longer intervals from the parted lips to the last her thought was occupied with paul the hateful atrocity from which he had suffered had returned to her memory the atrocity in which she felt herself cruelly involved with a certain tranquil majesty as in the eye of death she laid aside the human anxiety for spoken forgiveness and threw herself upon a solemn trust in the slow true judgment of time in the great and softening influence of distance to bring gently to his mind a better discernment of her nature and motives than her acts had left him now why thought she bemoaned the fact that death stayed my hand and stole my speech great hearts discern the hearts of others i will trust this even this this darkness and silence speech would seem sweet but i cannot reach him he will never know that i struck the mouth that reviled him i shall be a shadow in his thought but only for a time i will trust to the greatness of his heart now as i did not before my best friend you to whom i owe my best why was my life poisoned by that bitter doubt of you the bitter sweetness of this unspoken trust is only left me now she lay still as death small white broken but the voiceless cry in its intensity might have vanquished space and penetrated to the ear of her friend meanwhile honora startled at her absence and still more by littleton's arrival and news was hurrying on her way to the flat in his company her heart laden by an apprehension which had stirred it all too late it was a little after midday on monday that lucilla's eyes opened once more in the conviction that the room was light again it appeared to her a subdued imperfect light out of which the bookshelves and the old bureau curiously and familiarly loomed she longed for the power to turn her eyes to the window and catch a glimpse of the blue sky or even of the london grey again but such a movement was beyond her her eyes had fixed themselves on the door which stood opposite would it not open at last surely it would open 
why else should she gaze there with such certain expectation and now surely surely it had moved forwards there was a mist which prevented her from knowing certainly the darkness had returned but how otherwise could it be that everything was changing that the sense of a presence near her was so strong assuredly that was a human hand laid upon hers ah the very weariness and weakness were passing away perhaps it had been a dream the weight and misery melted from her brain a deep peace crept over her heart she was quite well now she was coming back to life the nightmare of months was over and gone she remembered that her shoes lay near her bedside it would be easy to stretch her hand and get them she would put them on and run down the stairs and herself carry her own message to paul's door and in such a moment the girl's broken spirit floated away End of chapter twenty two chapter twenty three of transition this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org transition by emma frances brooke chapter twenty three the snow lay thick upon the ground of the rectory garden and blown by the piercing wind clung in little heaps along the window frames honora shivered as she stood in the long bedroom that was still called her own after her residence in london the width of the landscape the expanse of sky grey winterly and heavy with clouds induced a feeling of defencelessness and solitude she was dressed in mourning and her face was thinner and paler than it had been and in her eyes when they were still was a hint of grave pathos infinitely beautifying there was nothing cheerless or despondent in her aspect her black dress even was relieved by white at the throat and wrists her bearing was composed as ever but the over elation was subtracted from it each morning when she waked her earliest thought told her that lucilla was dead this was the first vacation that honora had spent at home since she left the rectory in dudgeon after the first paroxysm of grief was over leslie had brought her down abstaining however from himself participating in the meeting between the father and daughter her arrival at the rectory had been late in the evening and her realization of the changes that had occurred there began only at the moment when she stepped from the cab and the front door was opened the memory of former home returnings had led her unconsciously to picture a blaze of light in the hall and the glow of fires from the open doors of several rooms a servant or two being there to receive her instead of this her father stood on the threshold alone his face was full of tender welcome but the oldness of his clothes struck her instantly behind him was the flicker of one niggard wick floating in oil for light is expensive and a small economical glow from the open doorway of his study all the other rooms were closed one surmised the darkness and the dreariness on which the keys were turned at the moment when her father led her into his study honora her heart tender with its grief would have given all she had to have dropped her handsome furs into obscurity and to have stood before him in the most worn of her working dresses the next day's discoveries repeated those of her arrival the rectory and the rectory garden had only been defended from the encroachments of decay by a single pair of domestic hands during months of time the hands belonged to a rough maiden from the village who did what she could in the kitchen to make the rector comfortable and who spent the rest of her time in faint cleaning skirmishes amongst the many deserted rooms of the old house as to his garments with those she was faithful but inadequate honora noted with an indescribable pang that his worn shoes were tied with string in default of black ribbon he is my father said she looking down at her well-cut gown and he is dressed like a beggar while my clothes are new 
on that morning she left her cold bedroom to seek the one inhabited room downstairs where breakfast was laid ever since her return her ingenuity had been exercised in trying to provide him with little luxuries without his knowledge she fancied that she met with resistance subtle but firm this morning he stood before the fire when she entered a letter in his hand honora caught up a pair of scissors from her work-basket which necessarily had intruded itself amongst the rector's books and taking his aged hand in her own began snipping the frayed edges of his shirt-cuffs honora philia mea said the old man you have come back to make me feel the beauty of human love and companionship now father the other hand and these shirt-links are not fastened my scissors have made the cuffs tidier the rector submitted looking with a curious wonder at the white capable fingers and the vigorous wavy hair which she displayed as she bent over the work honora continually repressed an inclination to sob by tender activities of the kind he is coming to-morrow honora said her father leslie oh i know that she returned absently now promise me something what is that my daughter said he a faint anxiety in his face that you will eat the egg i am going into the kitchen to cook for you poached father dear cocoa is not enough for you it was wonderful to be waited on by honora it was wonderful to be forced to eat the dishes prepared by her hands when the egg was brought it was exquisitely done for honora had had practice in cookery her cheek had been caught by the fire and the crossness of the handmaiden had had to be combated the rector ate his morsel in silence the meal was for her sake not his own it was wonderful that this capable brilliant creature whose existence seemed scarcely connected with his own should make his little comforts and necessities her concern his lips softened into a gentle play of affection every time he looked at her honora was satisfied to have returned to him the things by which she had been repulsed attracted her now this atmosphere of serene holiness was a constant strengthening consolation not elsewhere to be found for grief while the exercise of her ingenuity in combating daily by strategy his ascetic habit filled up insensibly the feeling of her loss the rector yielded a tranquil submission where it was possible as one yields matters to the love of a beautiful child which one would not surrender to an equal now and then he broke into a gentle expostulation you overwhelm me honora with a personal indulgence long discarded by me this self-denial is not a means only to that deed of reparation concerning which i spoke with you before it is also a means of keeping bright my spiritual armour a humble effort to follow in the steps of my lord who had not where to lay his head the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests but the son of man hath not where to lay his head the rector's faraway eyes gazed over the plate of dainty food which honora had placed before him seeking after that immemorial figure for the traces of whose steps he constantly watched meanwhile it was easier to combat the movements of natural appetite than the pleading face of a beautiful daughter and the caressing hand that was busy even now with the table napkin under his chin in a ludicrous endeavour to create some semblance to an alderman at a city feast to such an ear as her father's honora felt that she could confide the story of her grief one evening she brought a footstool and placing it near his feet sat down upon it and drew the volume out of his hand and laid it aside and in that attitude she told him all she knew of the story of lucilla the rector laid his hand upon her head when he found that she was weeping and you love this strange lovely child honora said he deeply father dear never another so much do not think philia mea that the child's ignorant aspiration was lost i am touched by this history of a maiden whose heart was stricken by the sight of the undisputed sway of evil in our metropolis i moved at this undirected effort of a tender girl to contribute to the world's salvation she parted willingly with her treasure on earth to lay up treasure in heaven so we must think of it honora and not as a loss she gave her life what can a man do more she was one of those who in painful ignorance it may be and not knowing how to tarry the lord's leisure yet made ventures for christ's sake 
it would have been my privilege had she lived to have known this young girl and to have learnt from her also it may be to have instructed her time was in my youth when the church shrank with a fear far from godly from the reforming movement within the state and i myself have yearned too much to be freed from the vexatious disputes of men the raging of the heathen but years have shown me that the ark of the church is safe amid the storms of the world and that god speaks to his people in the storm of men's affairs as well as through the services of his church and it becomes his ministers to listen in that storm for the still small voice of his guidance and to hear it gladly be comforted honora he who placed the aspiration in this child's heart understood it and in spite of the mistakes of her ignorance will know how to fulfil it honora raised the old hand reverently and kissed it the difference in opinion between them was still there but the changes brought by love and grief had modified her attitude it was the new tenderness of her heart which made her capable of gathering a meaning from that far-away spiritual holiness and discovering an adequate interpretation of his words there is something more i want to speak about father said she timidly will you let me open your heart to the one who loves you my daughter it is that i know you are not using the one hundred and fifty pounds of my mother's income that i left you i am rich i have far more than that more than i need or can use and since i knew lucilla i have hated luxury and display but you are too rigorous towards yourself you deny yourself necessaries only use the one hundred and fifty pounds for my sake father dear she raised her head from his knee with a coaxing entreaty in her face that crept to his heart i cannot put on my furs again unless you promise me and i am cold the rector stroked her hair with inimitable gentleness his hand upon her head felt like a benediction put on your furs filia pretiosa the lord forbid you should be cold or suffer said he the service of the lord to me is peace there was not a hint of yielding in his voice i think said honora still more timidly that if my dear mother knew she would wish it to be as i say the rector did not reply for several minutes she noticed that his hand lay heavier on her head she was sure he was thinking no said he presently in a low clear voice if i thought that i would yield but she was ever before me in the road her spiritual insight was swifter she as the beloved disciple lay near the heart of our lord my daughter put this tender anxiety from your mind it is well with me the consolations of my god flow full and deep upon me honora knew that it was vain to press him further she sat quite still looking into the small glow of the grate towards which it was necessary to press near to keep warm and presently she found herself inspired by a new idea she caught her father's hand in both of hers and looked up eagerly then make me another promise cried she with confidence in her voice he smiled down upon her and what is this beloved he asked that money has been saving up and there is capital of course behind it take that too dear father and use that with the rest i cannot touch it and never will it is for lucilla's sake i am sure that though i never understood her this is something like one of the things she meant take it dear father the rector leaned back in his chair and said nothing it was impossible to refuse honora's request but his delicate sense of justice shrank from her proposal that which was church property he was tenacious of for uses of the church but this money was in no sense sacredly set apart for the exclusive service of the lord as he would have put it and the girl for whose sake honora was surrendering it would probably have desired to return the money to the city of her love in some object of direct usefulness to its inhabitants finally it was arranged between them that the fortune of honora's mother was to be presented for some collective purpose through littleton to the man to whom lucilla's last broken words were addressed thus the inconceivable had by process of time and experience fallen naturally to its place and honora without grudge or hesitation had handed her own fortune to the socialist sheridan for uses of the community even as her father had in his way done before her this time when leslie came he lingered one afternoon shortly after his arrival the iron grimness of the weather relaxed in favour of blue skies and sunshine leslie went out to see the communal possessions of the village if the rectory had decayed there had been lavish improvements in the adornment of the church 
the edifice itself had been enlarged to accommodate the congregation of the poor who flocked to hear the words of a man who supplemented his burning sermons by so much reality in practice the organ was new and the music had been improved at some cost the rector's aim was to ensure the conduct of a service whose exterior beauty and solemn perfection should answer in a measure to his own deep sense of the spiritual significance of the church sacraments and offices again the doors of the church were always open as an invitation to the wayfaring man to repose every day at an hour when it was possible for the villagers to attend there was music for their refreshment and at even tide a short service the schools too were adorned and extended and a reading-room had been opened the rector thought he discerned the budding of a rich crop of piety in his flock honora still surveyed these things in a silence within which lurked a remnant of protest inwardly she marvelled at the largeness of her father's ideas and the success of his achievement leslie went on to the hills he wanted them and their solitude for his thoughts he was no more precipitate in his crowning bid for happiness than he had been in the preliminary steps or in forming his moral conclusions honora seen again in her own home was the changed honora of london experience with something of the old light of old surroundings upon her by the side of her brilliant youth was the figure of her father slowly fading out of life in the midst of his exquisite and unique achievement leslie never thought of him without a thrill of the heart but it was the figure of the daughter that perpetually haunted his mind always there was that passage of honora through his thoughts and now as he walked over the hills upon which a covering of snow lay in dazzling whiteness the frost-hardened ground ringing under his step and the deep calm silence around honora's image her voice gestures face her frown and her smile passed hither and thither up and down his mind ceaselessly now and then another face rose in his memory and hung there for a brief season it was always still and uplifted the lips parted in expectation and it was as far away as the dream in her eyes that was lucilla's following it came always inevitably the strong face of sheridan leslie stopped in his walk and looked over the hills with knitted brows one wonderful cone-shaped peak lay tremulous and shadow-like on the horizon distinguished only from the slow-moving clouds by its motionlessness dotted amongst the fields hanging on rough ledges of the hills a burden of snow behind and upon them were the old stone cottages of the weavers monuments of a dead industry deserted now cold and dreary to ordinary eyes to littleton the long upper chambers were instinct with memories the very look of them wakened his living sympathy with the passionate heartbeat of the chartist he sought out one in particular in which he had been informed the old weaver norbury whose insignificant existence had proved so ominous to honora had lately passed away he had died hugging to the last the political dream of his youth and in spite of the fact that its formulations had become political commonplaces still deeming its inner aspiration unfulfilled and keeping his faith in it as for a future hope there is no such thing said leslie as the fulfilment of a dream the dreamer stammers out conditions that appear to sum it up but they being fulfilled the vision itself looms larger and more distinct my deepest faith is in dreams thought he he was standing near one of the low stone walls of the country and now that his own steps had ceased the silence was so deep that any little accidental sound cut it like a rip in a texture deep and majestic also was the solitude and through this silence and solitude came to him a clearer sense even than that which habitually haunted his mind of the period of transition in which he lived a knowledge not mournful but tinged with solemn joy that the watchwords of the past are outworn and fading away to make place for the watchwords of the future dim and undefined at present but charged with hope and progress and high inspiration then felt i like some watcher of the skies when a new planet swims into his ken or like stout cortez when with eagle eyes he stared at the pacific and all his men looked at each other with a wild surmise silent upon a peak in darien such was leslie in this moment hitherto in spite of intellectual apprehension 
his virility had not always been able to escape moments of hesitation or the sickness and futility of regret a futile regret for a finished past that century sickness coincident to a period of transition which touches even stern and acquiescent minds when resigning their warm nests of the past and which mounts to panic and clamour in the coarser natures of common unbelievers who are unable in the momentary twilight to conceive of the changing future save as the offspring of devils and of fools just now the cry of littleton was for a leader a man consummate who should interpret social visions into actualities more swiftly but was such an one possible to an age of averages he asked himself whether the time was capable of imbuing any single personality with so much of the majesty of its qualities as to lift him conspicuously above his fellows its tendency he thought was rather to distribute its best characteristics so as to raise the democratic average than to create giants of resource and power the very raising of the average reciprocally affected the foremost ranks so that one after another in ever swifter measure new spirits equipped by energy genius and clear intention stepped to the front and by their increasing numbers dimmed the pretension of any particular candidate in an age when genius is common and talent signifies mediocrity is it possible in the nature of things that a leader can be awaking the search for the rare man is even keener the test severer no mere aspirant will meet it the spirit falls where it listeth and none can by willing call it to himself as the words passed his mind there floated into his memory so that it hung there in unwonted clearness the face of the dead lucilla the grey eyes with their onward look and the lips parted in suppressed expectation with a sudden impulse he stooped down and wrote the syllables of a name with his finger on the snow when leslie returned it was getting dusk the lights were not yet lit for the economy in the rectory put off the season of lamps and oil burning leslie found honora in a small sitting-room which as a child she had been accustomed to regard as a schoolroom here she was at liberty to keep up for leslie and herself her own standard of comfortable living she adjusted that standard to her father's nothing could induce her to put a match to her own lamp until her father's was illumined leslie found her therefore sitting in the firelight a book upon her knee her hands clasped behind her head absorbed apparently in thought around her appropriately enough were shelves full of school-books and some of these she had pulled down the table was strewn with them as also with papers on which she had been taking notes and making entries littleton as he entered had the feeling of unreality and of isolation common to intense thinkers as though the atmosphere created by his own thoughts on the hills remained with him now and enclosed him in a world of his own throwing over external surroundings a distant and unsubstantial appearance honora scarcely moved when he came in she looked at him from under her eyelids and faintly smiled he sat down opposite and himself experienced the pleasantly soporific effect of firelight it intensified the fantastic evanescent feeling of wonder until the room was charged with it littleton was altogether in a curious mood he seemed to be sitting aloof even from himself in a condition of absolute calm watching the faces and the figures that flashed and vanished in his mind honora the rector lucilla sheridan they came and went in strange monotonous repetition as though their being there together were in itself of import and as though at any moment their visionary proximity would spell a meaning to him i am going up by the night train said he presently i have sent my portmanteau on before no dark heart to take you now returned honora smiling so that i have the advantage of a walk under this splendidly clear sky i am sorry you are going littleton considered the little sentence and the tone in which it had been spoken are you asked he gently after the pause oh yes leslie you must come again she spoke so warmly so emphatically littleton through the window saw the stars crowding out in the sky they were worlds full of light and life they were pricks of a pin in a surface which the room seemed to heave and fall at one moment he stood on the edge of an abyss in the next he was shut up between walls i shall follow you back to london soon said she still with her hands behind her head against the chair back to me it will be different yes said leslie kindly and what i wonder are you returning to now 
to my ordinary work and more than ever to socialism i heard from sheridan at last this morning that means news your face tells me so yes honora sheridan has accepted the trust he tells me that for long he hesitated unable to assure himself that he was the best to fulfil lucilla's wishes as expressed through you he bases his final consent solely on that piece of paper on which we found the three words written and which i immediately conveyed to him he believes that he is able to understand them and that by accepting the trust of this money for her and applying it to the wisest purpose of socialism within his power of discernment he will best be replying to the spirit of that message he said that to do anything for her which he conceived was in the spirit of her deepest wishes was an unspeakable relief to him do you follow all this said she not all i know that sheridan was deeply moved and deeply startled by her death i know that when i handed him the paper he read into it at once something more than i could understand there was a quarrel between them there was discord misery no ordinary quarrel honora of that i am sure i hardly know if we may name it discord and misery i think that the divergences of some minds have higher harmony within them than we find in the acquiescence of others honora said no more her mind was with lucilla leslie looked up to the window the stars were crowding out quicker than ever the snow-laden branches lay across the blackness of the window-pane dimly white and still as that death on which they had spoken and they made him think of the name he had left written upon the hills and freezing now into clear letters under a starlit sky when he next spoke it was very gently very slowly and very deliberately your work does it satisfy you honora my work the illusion seemed to startle her she altered her attitude for the first time bringing her arms down and sitting upright my work oh yes when we come to that it is odd how i do like it how completely satisfied i am how deeply interested in it i find myself to be i have come to have great faith in it in this career i realize myself more than in any i have pictured i did not know my own faculties and proclivities until i had tried them then my absolute independence suits me i am standing on my own basis and i do not find myself conquered by events but on the whole conquering them i have a worthy career a definite place what more than all this can i desire i am satisfied i shall never wish for anything different i shall never marry honora did not know why she had uttered that last sentence it is possible that some ineffectual wave from the mind of the thinker opposite brokenly touched her impelling her to words the more inappropriate in that they were a coincidence at the moment a flame leaped up in the fire and revealed leslie's face gazing at her his eyes grave and sad held hers and her heart stood still there came into her mind a swift strange apprehension of something that might have been and which yet she might miss she sat more upright and waited in dim and rather fearful expectation it was possible that all her preconceived ideas might be overturned in a moment and that something might be revealed which hitherto her resolute common sense had sternly held back from her conscious calculations the silence was prolonged during the time leslie's mind probed deeply into the nature of things and then he spoke you are right said he firmly and quietly quite right they sat a little longer in silence this time it was disturbed by honora's rising from her chair the commonplace rustle of her dress sounded to leslie like the falling of the first spadeful of earth on a coffin the clock on the mantelpiece struck and then he too rose to his feet it is time for me to go said he you will put on your great coat said honora absently yes said he and then they shook hands honora was surprised to find how calmly she stood on the hearthrug looking before her with a perplexed brow and then she became aware that he was gone and that the door had shut gently behind him she heard his steps along the hall and the louder closing of the front door in that sound there was so much finality that she experienced a great and singular perturbation two tears stole down her cheeks and her teeth were almost driven into her under lip to keep back a flood of others from following oh lucilla come back to me i am very lonely she cried leslie walked rapidly through the village as he neared the church he saw that it was lavishly lighted and the sounds of the organ and the voices of the choir stole towards him across the frost-clear air 
he remembered this was the late service to which the rector loved to collect such of his flock as would attend a mediaeval hand seemed softly laid upon his nineteenth-century shoulder and he paused the music acted on his sore and agitated feeling not soothingly but rather to intensify it to an excruciating point the peace and mildness of it affected him as a reproach which as yet he could not translate he went on walking savagely and putting space between himself and the rectory as quickly as he could as he went he tried to tell himself that he had received no mortal wound finally he turned a corner and passed suddenly from the silence of the snow-covered road into the cheerful activity and prose of the station there was a considerable noise there whistling shunting and the panting of an engine and leaping as it were out of the chaos of busy sounds came a thought that drew the colour to his cheek he stood still the image of honora seemed to be near him soft and blurred in tears i wish i could see her like that he said but i don't know that i deserve anything he drew back into the hedge so that chance passers-by might not so easily discern him and when a train rushed into the station which he judged to be his own he did not move it went out again leaving him still standing where he was and then in a strange heat he turned on his steps and began to make his way back by a short cut to the rectory he thought of the meagre light which honora was wont to set up in the little schoolroom and by which he sometimes sat late into the night studying was that light still burning or would it be extinguished suddenly he began to run not content with the pace even of a rapid walk a feeling of self-derision spurred him it had always been so hard to leslie to decide will she forgive me he thought i have acted like a fool the white fields and hedges raced past him he thought of honora's calm manner of her brightness and her cordial tones he criticised her while his heart beat and burnt now he pictured her snipping the frail light out with her fingers then it blazed clear and strong and her head was bowed beneath it weeping that he said might save me he turned a corner and the rectory buildings lay massed before him in cold dark heaps it was an eyeless thing sullen and poverty-stricken under the winter's night tremblingly he searched over the darkened windows the rector's lamp was extinguished and the study closed beyond in a humble corner of the building half hidden behind a tree he thought he saw a ray from the little schoolroom window inside sat honora at the table her head bowed amongst her books in a trouble and despair that no effort of will could hold in abeyance she still fought for her equilibrium but it was with losing forces leslie re-entering called her softly by her name she lifted her head and the pair of long-tried friends gazed silently each into the eyes of the other and suddenly honora saw him as he was the difficulties of his slow and reticent nature and the worth of it that lay behind were clear to her mind as clear to her judgment stood her own relation to him with an instant and simple gesture she laid her hands upon his shoulders and his own followed them he pressed them with the warm insistent pressure of a man and it went to her heart so that her fingers melted and clung to his and her eyes and whole face changed under his gaze in such a moment the great and golden glory of passion which had always lain as a possibility behind her friendship came to her there was a beauty in her face he had not seen before and it was for him i have great need of love leslie said she with a grave and lovely smile the end of chapter twenty three the end of transition by emma francis brooke